Brothers and sisters, we are ready to begin our third class. Our speaker is Brother Neville Clark. The theme for Brother Clark's classes this week is Revelation, Things Which Must Shortly Come to Pass. Today's class is entitled, The Rise of the Beast. Brother Neville. Well, thank you, Brother Chairman, and good morning, my dearly loved brethren and sisters, and our Lord Jesus Christ. I had a brother uh, say to me yesterday that he didn't think I was putting enough information into the time we have before us. <laughs> and he uh, wondered if I could pick up the pace a little bit. So I'm going to try and do that this morning. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> so this is where we began yesterday. And we considered, as you'll recall, the top line of that slide, the the life cycle, if you would, of the dragon, the Eastern European Empire. We spoke yesterday about the fact that the latter-day manifestation of that dragon would be Russia because of the migration of the throne, if you would, of Constantinople to Moscow, but that in due time Russia will reconquer Constantinople, at which point the two legs of Daniel's image would be standing upon the two ancient capitals of Constantine's empire, Constantinople and Rome. This morning we're going to deal with the beast, which of course is the bottom couple of rows. But when I say the beast, I mean only this portion of the timeline. We're going to talk about, well, a little bit on the great red dragon, then the beast of the sea, the scarlet colored beast, and of course the beast of the earth. When Constantine took over sole control of the Roman Empire, he did two things. In 324 AD, he Christianized the empire. That's the first thing. And the second thing was that he created a second capital. He created Constantinople. Over time, because those two capitals began to act independent of one another, and the empire began to function more like two sub-empires than one coordinated empire, the book of Revelation addressed that by creating two beasts. So the, the, the great red dragon of Revelation chapter 12, that pagan Roman Empire, converted to Christianity in 324 AD and then bisected itself between Rome in the west and Constantinople in the east. Constantinople, of course, being the military capital, Rome subsequently becoming the religious capital. But there's a critical thing to appreciate about these two animals, that is the dragon and the beast. When Christ returns, the dragon will be bound for a thousand years, and he will not be destroyed until something around the year 3000, at the end of the millennium. That's not true of the beast. The beast will be destroyed at the start of the millennium. And the reason is because of those two, the beast is infinitely more dangerous than the dragon. Now, you might not think that's the case, because the dragon's a military power. But the fact of the matter is, the beast absolutely cannot be allowed to remain alive, even if you chain them up, cannot be allowed to remain alive into the kingdom age. We're going to see why this morning, but it's extremely dangerous. The next thing to appreciate about this slide is this. The great red dragon had seven heads and ten horns. The beast of the sea of Revelation 13 verse 1, seven heads, ten horns. The scarlet colored beast of Revelation 17, seven heads, ten horns. That is the continuum of the beast. The great red dragon ceased its phase in 324 AD and gave rise to the beast of the sea, which continued from 324 to 1957, which is the year of the Treaty of Rome, the formation of the EU. From 1957 till its destruction, that beast is called the scarlet-colored beast. It's the same animal. The significant point, however, is that for a particular phase of the life of the beast of the sea, there was also a beast of the earth. For a thousand years, between 800 approximately and 1800 AD. There's a great significance about that. But the salient point for us to remember is that the beast of the earth was destroyed by Napoleon Bonaparte at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1806. It is a representation of the Holy Roman Empire. Therefore, it has existed in the past, but it exists no more today and will not exist in the future. The manifestation of the beast that will be alive and well when the Lord Jesus Christ returns 
is that of Revelation chapter 17, the scarlet-colored beast, seven heads, ten horns, ridden by the woman of the Catholic Church. So that's the story, really, of the beast of Revelation. And this is where those beasts live. I only want to address the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth this morning. The beast of the sea, so-called because he encompasses the coastal regions of Western Europe. The beast of the earth, earth, so-called because he's an inland beast. So you could think of the beast of the sea as being Western Europe, perhaps, the beast of the earth being Central Europe. And in 330 AD, this is how things looked in Constantine's empire. He has successfully bifurcated the empire. He's got two capitals. Everything went well, went well for about another 120 years. This division happened in 330 AD. But by 450 AD, things got very, very serious. There was a terrific disaster on the horizon in the form of Attila the Hun. The third trumpet of Revelation chapter 8 is sounded, and the Huns come across from the, from the east. Now, what had happened, of course, in the Roman Empire from Constantine's time and onwards was the, uh, the Roman military employed mercenaries. They employed the barbarian tribes of Western Europe as mercenaries, and the mercenaries, therefore, came to be the greatest soldiers of the Roman Empire as the Roman Empire was to decline and fall. Those mercenaries, as the centuries went by, wanted to own land in the Roman Empire but the emperors refused. They wanted to live within the Roman Empire. The emperors refused. They weren't Roman. They were Christian. They spoke the same language. They married their women. They weren't Roman. They couldn't own land. Well, this changed everything. Because when the Huns came across, everybody retreated into the borders of the Western Roman Empire because the Huns were so ferocious, so capable, so merciless, that even the barbarians of Western Europe were no match for them. Attila only lived... 20-odd years in the capacity of the conqueror, but his job was done. And in 476 AD, Rome, the city, fell to the Ostrogothic barbarian tribe. And all the rest of Western Europe, the ten tribes, took over. And the empire was bisected, as it were, ten ways. And that's represented for us, as we found yesterday, in Revelation 13 and verse 1 where it says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. This is the beast of the sea, who began life in 324 AD. It's a Christian beast. He had seven heads and ten horns, but upon his horns ten crowns, because we have now decentralized control. Rome has fallen. The barbarians are ruling themselves. And the name of blasphemy, because of course he was Catholic. Well, that was significant, of course, because the fall of Rome meant the demise of the imperial head. The emperor fell in 476 AD, and the seventh head, the, the, the seventh form of rulership, the Gothic form of rulership, commenced in Rome from 476 AD for a period of about 60 years. It tells us that in Revelation 13, verse 3. I saw one of his heads, that is one of the, form, the seven forms of government of the Roman Empire, wounded to death, but his deadly wound was healed. Well, that wound came upon the sixth imperial head, and the Goths were the people that inflicted that wound. Now, that wound would be healed. But for a while, everybody wondered after the beast. They marveled at the beast. How could one of the barbarians, who was so hated by the emperors of Rome, now be in control of Rome itself? Well, of course, verse 4 tells us, that the dragon gave power to the beast. And Justinian came to the rescue, ejected the Goths from the city of Rome, but didn't really, Justinian, I mean, didn't really reinstall the sixth head. I mean, there's no question Justinian was an emperor, but Rome itself never became independent of him. No doubt the Goths were removed for Rome, from Rome, but no government was put in place to replace them in Rome. Instead, the capital was moved to Ravenna in northeastern Italy. Rome was ruled by an ambassador of Constantinople and degraded to a second-class city. So you might say at this point, the beast of the sea has no head. There is no form of government in Rome. There is no independent form of government in Rome. Constantinople rules Rome as a vassal and everything to the north of Italy, the barbarians are under the control of. 
So the beast, as it were, has no head, no active head on the beast of the sea, and Western Europe's plunged into the Dark Ages. A, a, a de-civilization begins to occur. Knowledge is lost. And nobody felt that more keenly than the man in Rome. Because by and by, these barbarians started to encroach upon the city of Rome itself. And the Pope in Rome was in a desperate position. We had the Lombards coming down from the north. We had the Vandals migrating from North Africa across to Sicily and then up the Italian peninsula coming from north and south upon the city of Rome. Now the problem with these barbarians was that whilst they were Christian, they were Arian. They were not Trinitarian. They had no use for the Pope. They had no respect for the Pope. They thought that life would be better off without the Pope at all. Well, that caused the Pope to write a letter to a dear friend. And he found the most powerful of the ten horns, and he wrote to him and said, Dear Charlemagne, in 800 AD, I need help. Will you come and save me? Well, Charlemagne came and, and defeated the Lombards in northern Italy, and between himself and the Pope, formed an empire, over which Charlemagne was the emperor, and the Pope was the Pope. It was a duly... Uh, governed empire, but now we have installed an imperial head. We have an emperor once more. This is the revival of the sixth head of the beast. You might think of it as the eighth head of the beast, but so significant was this eighth head, which is simply a resurrection of the sixth, that it's given its own beast. And the story of that is contained in Revelation 13 verse 11. I, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns, emperor and Pope. Two horns like a lamb, he spoke as a dragon, he exercised all the power of the first beast, that is the sea beast of verse 1, before him. He caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Charlemagne has healed the wound of verse 3. He's reinstalled an imperial form of rulership in Central Europe. And as I say, what, what we're simply saying, therefore, is that the beast of the earth of Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, is simply the eighth head, or the sixth head resurrected of the beast of the sea of Revelation 13 and verse 1. But so significant was this head that it's given its own identity as a beast. So significant was it. Well, things ran along just fine. Well, let me just... Pause and consider this. Holy Roman Empire. Holy, because it had, it, spoke, it had two horns like a lamb. It mimicked the Lamb of God. Roman, because it spake like a dragon. Empire, because it exercised all the power of the first beast. So it was, if you like, a, a subset of the greater empire of the beast of the sea. Well, as I was about to say, things rolled along just fine. Charlemagne died. He bequeathed the empire that he'd created to his three sons. And those sons, if you could think of it like this, the western son got France, the two, the, the, I guess the, the, the second son got uh, half of that purple area there, Arkin, Frankfurt and so forth, and the third son got the east of that purple area. Well, those three sons didn't really get along, and the, the Frankish son, if I could call him that, didn't want to be part of the empire. So the two Germanic sons joined together, and that became the Holy Roman Empire, it was begun by a Frenchman, but very quickly became a Germanic empire. The capital, moving from Aachen to Frankfurt to Vienna over the next thousand years. Charlemagne was crowned by Leo III, Pope Leo III, king of the Holy Roman Empire in Aachen Cathedral in Germany on Christmas Day in 800 AD. The empire continued for 1,000 years until Napoleon Bonaparte destroyed it in 1806. So things were fine, as I say, until the unthinkable occurred. And what happened, of course, was that there was a revolution in France, and the French monarchy fell, and the guillotine rolled out the heads of 30,000 people in the reign of terror in the revolution. And they called upon the only man that could bring law and order back to France. But God had another idea. His purpose wasn't just to remove anarchy from France. God's purpose was to kill the beast of the earth, to bring, a, to bring an end to that phase of the beast of the sea, if you like. 
Well, it began as an earthquake in Revelation 11, and it, it continued as a grievous sore throughout Revelation chapter 16, so that by 1810, Western Europe was divided into three categories. The purple, France. The light purple, countries allied with France. The pink, sorry, the light purple, countries controlled by France. The pink, countries allied with France. And the orange there, countries at war with France. Napoleon has taken the entire territory of the beast of the sea apart from Portugal. He's got everything. And Napoleon, of course, wanted to form a French empire. That would never be God's plan. It was God's plan that Napoleon killed the beast. And then God had finished with Napoleon. So that within a very short time after Napoleon had taken all this territory, well, you know, the 1812 overture, he lost his army in Russia. He was imprisoned on Elba. He escapes. He's imprisoned after the Battle of Waterloo and dies in exile. And then that great French empire, you can see there, shrank straight back to the borders of France. And look how Revelation describes that. Revelation 17 and verse 8. Because now we've got a problem. Napoleon has killed the beast of the earth. He thought he could replace it with a French beast. That wasn't God's plan, so God took Napoleon out of the way. What is there in Europe then? We've got an, we've, we're back to barbarians ruling Europe. That's a major problem. And as far as Revelation 17 verse 8 is concerned, the beast, now the beast here in Revelation 17 verse 8 is the beast of the sea, the same beast as Revelation 13 verse 1. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now what we're talking about here is the rise of the beast in the form of the European Union. The point is that after Napoleon had finished with him, he descended into the bottomless pit. The word, or the phrase bottomless pit, the word pit ought not to be there in the translation. It's just the word bottomless. It's the, it's the Greek word abusos, from which we get the English abyss. The beast descended into the abyss. He collapsed into a hole in the ground. He didn't die. He just went into hibernation. And he melted into the population of Europe. The word abyss is elsewhere translated deep, which means ocean. Well, in uh, Revelation 17 and verse 15, the ocean is the waters, if you like, the sea of humanity of Europe. The beast just melted into the population. The idea of an, an empire remained, but the physical practicality of an empire had been destroyed by Napoleon Bonaparte. And, and France had dried back up to the borders of France, so there was nothing in Europe. So now we've got, an, we've got, a, we've got a, uh, a continent who has imperial aspirations, but no empire. And she's had an empire for a thousand years, which defined her, a Catholic empire. And now it's gone. Well, that's an untenable situation. And it proved to be untenable. I mean, we've got to try. The Confederation of the Rhine, you can see there. The Germans are trying. They're trying to get unity. They're trying, they're trying to stop fighting each other. But... It, it, it's hopeless. It's completely hopeless. The most powerful nation in Central Europe will not stand idle. And so, of course, in 1914, they declare war. What's the purpose of the war? To reunite Europe, to bring back an empire. Well, they fail. But 30 years later, they try again. What's the German word for empire? Reich. The Third Reich. So what was the First Reich? Well, Charlemagne strictly formed the first empire because he, he formed the Holy Roman Empire. But of course, Adolf Hitler wouldn't accept Charlemagne as the former of the first empire. He would roll the clock forward to maybe 1200 AD when Frederick of Barbarossa, the first German emperor, took over the empire. And he called that the First Reich. What's the Second Reich? Well, that's the Second Reich. It didn't succeed. And so this is the Third Reich. How long did he want the Third Reich to last for? A thousand years. Why? Two reasons. Because the Holy Roman Empire had lasted a thousand years, begun and end by French, ended by Frenchmen. But that had lasted a thousand years. And secondly, uh, there is another Reich in Revelation chapter 20, which will also last for a thousand years. Hitler was Christian after all. Nominally. 
So he wants the third right. That was not destined to be the case, of course, but you see the point. Europe needs an empire. Europe had to have an empire. And because they had brought the world to war twice in one generation, drastic action had to be taken. And in 1951, we have the Treaty of Paris, which formed the European Coal and Steel Community. Determined to prevent another such terrible war, European governments concluded that pooling coal and steel production would, in the words of the Declaration, make war between historic rivals France and Germany not merely unthinkable, but materially impossible. What are they addressing? Well, you see, on the Franco-German border, there is what is called the Ruhr Valley, and in the Ruhr Valley, there is an enormous seam of coal. And anybody who plans to begin war, not quite the same today, but certainly true back then, immediately started harvesting coal from the seam. And Germany would be, be pulling out thousands and thousands of tonnes of coal. What do they want the coal for? For their furnaces. What do they want the furnaces for? To smelt steel. What do they want the steel for? Weapons. And so they corporatized the coal field between France and Germany so that neither could get access to it without the knowledge of the other so that Germany could never surprise us again with a war because Germany is prone to do that. Why is Germany prone? Because she, of course, was the capital of the Holy Roman Empire. And Western Europe must have an empire. Well, things continued, and in 1957 we had the Treaty of Rome. The Treaty of Rome was signed where? Does anybody know? The Treaty of Rome is going to form the European Union where Europe's not just going to pull their, pull their coal, but talk about economic unity, trade unity, uh, atomic energy unity, every kind of unity. Where did they sign the Treaty of Rome? In the Lateran Palace. Where's the Lateran Palace? In the Vatican. Why did they do that? Well, they didn't know it, but they did it because Revelation 17 says that the woman will ride the beast. It's a Catholic club. It's a Catholic federation. Countries like Turkey who want to join the EU, even if they have stronger economies than some of the EU members, will never be allowed to join because they're not Catholic. This is a Catholic club by Catholics for Catholics. Well, wow. look how it's described in Revelation 17, verse 3. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-coloured beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the latter-day revival of the ancient beast of the sea. 1957, this beast, takes, this beast is born. It's called the European Union, and it's ridden by the woman of the Catholic Church. And what will this beast do? What will be the, the salient characteristics of this beast? Verse 12 of Revelation 17. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, so these are the kings of Western Europe, which have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These kings have one mind, and they shall give their power and their strength unto the beast. Their power, the Greek word dunamos, their military power. The strength, the Greek word exousia, their political power. What's that saying? It's saying that the ten kings of Western Europe are going to give their power to a central body and that central body is going to govern for them. It's called, the EU calls itself, a supranational government. A government where power is delegated to an authority by member states. That is precisely what Revelation 17 and verse 13 is talking about. By the way, what happened to the crowns? Remember Revelation chapter 12, the crowns were upon the head of the beast, the pagan beast. We come to Revelation 13 verse 1, the crowns have migrated to the horns because we've decentralised the power of Roman government in the West. Where are the crowns here? Well, I think the woman has taken the crowns. They're no longer on the beast. She rides the beast. And the political direction of these nations is now controlled by the church. Remarkable, isn't it? This is precisely what we see in Western Europe today. And by the way, oops, 
They're not ashamed of their history. This is the uh, European headquarters in Brussels. And out the front, they have a woman riding a beast. And their flag and their coins have got 12 stars because they think Revelation chapter 12 is talking about Mary. Because, of course, this is the open letter of the Lord Jesus Christ to his bride, written in code, and the apostate bride can't interpret the code. Uh, we know it's an apostate Catholic system. The woman shrouded with 12 stars in Revelation 12. They think it's the Madonna. So they, they identify themselves with it, which of course is perfect for us because we agree with that identification, but for different reasons. Unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable. But now I'll show you something really interesting. Verse 14 of Revelation 17. What becomes of this beast? Verse 14 says that these kings shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them because he's lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So here is the destruction of the beast by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. You've got the lamb, which is Christ, and you've got those that are with him who are called chosen and faithful. That's the saints. So no difficulty understanding what this is but he's king of kings. So who do you suppose the kings are, verse 14? There, there is king, singular, that's the Lord, and there are kings, plural. Who are the kings, plural? Well, that'd be the, the ten horns, wouldn't they, of verses 12 and 13? And this is the call, implicit in this verse, that the kings of Western Europe cast their crowns before the Son of God. He is the king of kings. It doesn't matter what they think of themselves. What that's going to mean, of course, is that that woman's going to have to release the crowns. Well, she's not going to do it. But that's the requirement of verse 14. You know, verse 14, the, the, the story of verse 14 of Revelation 17 is contained in detail for us when you come across the page to Revelation 19. Here now is where the woman and the beast meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, because of course he's taken the crowns from all the kings of the world. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. He was dipped with a vesture, he was sorry, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name was called the Word of God, and the armies which were in heaven, that is the government of the future age, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So here's the man on the horse, with the armies of the saints following him, going to confront the beast of the, of the sea, now called the scarlet-coloured beast of Revelation chapter 17. And out of his mouth, verse 15 says, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron, because he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, where have you read that sort of language for? The winepress of the wrath of God. Well, that's Revelation chapter 14. That's the second appendix of Revelation chapter 14. That's the 30 years, one hour with the beast, which results in the destruction of the beast. That's the treading of the winepress of Europe, isn't it? And the result of this conflict is very clear. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So Christ and the saints are now at war with the beast, the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation 17. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which had deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image, these both, the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The beast and the false prophet are destroyed in year 50 at the commencement of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, as opposed to being bound for a thousand years throughout the kingdom age. So there's the story of the warfare of Western Europe. But you know, we've got a lot of detail about this war. 
because you might have noticed that in verse 15 of Revelation 19, we've got the mention of a rod of iron. That's a quotation from Psalm 2 and verse 9. And in verse 19 of Revelation 19, we've got reference to the kings of the earth. Well, that's a quotation from Psalm 2, verse 2. I think we better go back to Psalm 2, don't you? Because if Revelation 19, those half dozen verses we read, with a detail of Revelation 17, verse 4. I'm going to suggest to you that Psalm 2 is the detail of Revelation chapter 19. Now, what's happening in Psalm 2? Well, the structure of the psalm goes like this. Verses 1 to 3 are the vision. Verses 4 to 9 are the story of the psalm. And verses 10 and 11 are the wise advice at the end of the psalm. This psalm must relate to a time after the battle of Armageddon because it says in verse 6 of Psalm 2, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Well, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ only takes Zion after the battle of Armageddon in year 10. So clearly, Psalm 2 is happening after the Battle of Armageddon. Very clear. But look at this vision. This is the curtain lifted now upon the council of war in the, in the war cabinet of the beast. This is the discussion of the European Union as they prepare to confront the Lord Jesus Christ in a military confrontation in the last hour, prophetically, of their existence. Verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now the word rage, as your margin says, means to assemble tumultuously. It's the same word as Brother Matt showed us just a moment ago that appears in Daniel chapter 6, the word for tumult. Now that's interesting because that's exactly what, they, what happened at the crucifixion. A tumult was made in the Lord's mortal life. Well, here's another tumult in his immortal life by his enemies upon the earth. And why do they rage in verse 1? Well, because they think they're meeting in secret. And what they don't realise is that the prophet's telling us every word they speak in their bedchambers, this is the discussion of the European Parliament written 3,000 years before it happens. What do they say? Verse 2, the kings of the earth. Well, there's the kings of Revelation 17, those ten kings. They set themselves... And the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So the kings of the earth evidently have been subdued and something changes that upsets them and now they want to break free in verse 3 of Psalm 2. You see that? The implication of Psalm 2 verse 3 is that they are under subjection of some kind and they want to loose that bondage which they have come in under. It, it says uh, in verse 2 that the kings of the earth set themselves. The New International Version says they take their stand. So these kings are speaking in a formal context. There's a formal meeting. There are delegates. There are speakers. This is the European Parliament and they want to break his bands from them. So things apparently have been going along just fine, and now there's a problem, and that tells you something important. So hold Psalm 2, and just come with me to Psalm 66. I'll show you something. I'll show you Psalm 66, and then I'll explain what I think this means. Psalm 66 and verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honour of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works! Through, thy great, through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee, shall sing unto thee, and shall sing to thy name. Selah. Now what's happened? Well, think again about our timeline, the timeline of the seventh vial. Lord Jesus Christ returns and judges the household. Ten years later, we have the Battle of Armageddon. 
the Lord Jesus Christ takes Jerusalem and establishes his throne upon Zion. Then what happens? Well, the mid-heaven proclamation is uttered. What is the mid-heaven proclamation? It's an appeal to the world to cast their crowns, to give their crowns to the king and submit to his rule. Because as a little stone, he's going to envelop the entire world. Well, that's what is described in the first four verses of Psalm 66. And the result of that is that all the, all the earth shall worship thee and sing to thee and sing to thy name. But there's a problem in verse 3. Thine enemies submit themselves to me. And look at your margin beside the word submit. They yield feigned obedience. The submission's not genuine. The response to the Midheaven proclamation is not genuine. Nations submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. They give it a try, but their heart is not in it. And what happens in Psalm 2 is something changes to cause them to reconsider their position and cast his yoke from them. Can you see what's happening here? So the nations have submitted to the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Midheaven Proclamation, and now they want to be free of it, and they're going to oppose him. Well, what's the consequence of that? Psalm 2, verse 4. The whole scene changes, and it moves from the cabinet of the kings to the war cabinet of heaven. And it says in Psalm 2, verse, verse 4, Oh, he that, that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. What does this mean here in verses 4 to 6? This is the message the saints are going to take to the world from God. I've already chosen the king. I'm not choosing a second king. Do you understand what you're required to do? And then the decree comes from Jerusalem. The Lord himself speaks in verse 7. I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The Lord Jesus Christ makes a decree. So Jerusalem itself publishes a decree for the world to come to heal and submit to this new king. And then the father in verses 8 and 9 speaks to the son. So you see what's happening? The Father speaks to the world, verses 4 to 6. The Son speaks to the world, verse 7. The Father speaks to the Son, verses 8 and 9. Ask of me, Son, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Their utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Patience is running out. And the psalmist can see this way back up there in the, in the corridor of time. And he says, verse 10, be wise, O kings. Don't do it. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Kiss the sun. It means to be subject to the sun. 1 Kings 19 verse 18 says, Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel which have not bowed to Baal or kissed him. They don't have to physically kiss the sun, but they're going to be close to the sun. They're going to submit to the sun. So here's the question. When does this conflict of Psalm 2 take place? Well, we know from Revelation 17, verse 14, it's in the one hour with the beast. It's in this last 30 years. How do we know that? Well, because Revelation 17, verse 14, is expanded in Revelation 19, which quotes Psalm 2 on two occasions. Well, here's Psalm 2. So this is the discussion that's taking place in that 30 years. All right? So what's gone wrong? Why do the kings all of a sudden want to break the Lord's bonds from, from off them? They've submitted in the 10 years of the Midheaven Proclamation, but feignedly, it would appear. And so in year, call it year 20, year 21, the European Parliament's meeting. They're deciding what they're going to do about this king in Jerusalem. They're not happy. The saints warn them, don't continue meeting like this. Don't go through it. The, 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 the sun warns them from Jerusalem. 
but they're determined. What's gone wrong? Well, come back with me to Revelation. There's a key phrase here, I think, which tells you what's gone wrong. It occurs half a dozen times. In Revelation 16 and verse 14 is the first occasion. It's the phrase, the kings of the earth. Revelation 16 verse 14 says that these are the spirits of madness working miracles going forth to the kings of the whole earth to bring them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So the kings of the whole earth are gathered to the battle of Armageddon in year 10. Revelation 17, verse 2. There's a woman sitting on the back of the beast with whom, verse 2, the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So these kings are Catholic kings who have committed fornication with the woman. They love her. Verse 18, Revelation 17. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 18, verse 3. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Revelation 18, verse 9. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her. And then, of course, the same phrase, Revelation 19 and verse 19. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. All right. So the issues with the kings of the earth. Because of the kings of the earth, that phrase appears in Psalm 2, it appears in Revelation 19, verse 19, they've got their armies against the man on the horse and the saints. Why have they? What's happened to change them? Well, it's that event of year 20. The fall of Rome. Look at Revelation 18 and verse 8. Now, we just read the phrase, the kings of the earth, in Revelation 18 and verse 9. Those that have committed fornication with the woman live deliciously with her, bewailing her. Why are they bewailing her? Because, verse 8, her plague shall come in one day. Death, mourning, famine, she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Do you see what's happened? The Midheaven Proclamation goes out. But it's not su as successful as it should be. And the kings are submitting feignedly. So what does God do? Well, he destroys the city of Rome. Revelation 14, I think, verse 8 says, Babylon falls. Yes. But how is that spoken of in Revelation 18? He's killed the woman. He killed the woman. He destroyed the Catholic Church in year 20. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication with her are outraged that that king in Jerusalem could destroy the greatest Christian system that's ever existed upon the face of the earth. And they turn immediately and say, that's it, we've had enough. They convene meetings, they prepare for war against the king of Jerusalem and his army. And those kings that were drawn to the battle of Armageddon that relinquished control, that submitted for a moment, submit no, war, no more after the fall of Rome and after the death of their bride in Revelation 18 and verse 8. So the cry goes out and they assemble. They assemble. The psalmist says, don't do it. Think again. Kiss the sun. And the kings of the earth stand back and look in horror as smoke rises from the crater that's now being created in Rome. And the reaction's violent. They want revenge. And the cry comes up from the saints. Be wise, ye kings. Exercise restraint. They're not interested. They're not interested in the sun. Why not? Because they have their own spiritual father. The Pope, don't forget, did not die in Revelation 18, verse 8. He doesn't die until he's thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 19. He's a survivor. He survives the destruction of Rome. Well, Papa... What shall we do? Crucify him. Isn't that right? Crucify him. And so they gather, they gather their armies together and they attack the man on the horse. That's the power of the Catholic system. And that, brothers and sisters, is why it can never 
be allowed to live into the kingdom age. It's the greatest threat, of course, to the ecclesias today. It will forever, like Amalek, rail against the character of the king of Jerusalem and therefore must be destroyed in that immediately.